we were interested in looking specifically at Mexican origin leadership, strategy, and political priorities, uh, whether born here or born in Mexico. But it would be Mexico, Mexican origin specific, and that we were interested in binational issues, not just, in fact, primarily binational issues, not primarily domestic U.S. issues. In fact, that is our interest, and that's why we call it Enfoque Mexico or Focus Mexico, and that's why we did all the focus groups that so many people participated in. Uh, just to expand a little bit about what you're going to hear, the themes here is that over time, we didn't go in with a really, <coughs> use a big word, a really reified idea, a, a, a really a, a, a stiff and immovable idea or well-defined idea of Mexican-American leaders here and the United leaders over there. I mean, of course, we knew about the difference with regard to guest workers because of the Vicero program experience. But it wasn't that, that was not going to be the central area of our, of our study. But as we went along for practical reasons, uh, we organized focus groups in English and in Spanish. We invited those who, or gave people choice to, to choose one or the other, uh, uh, because we would conduct, we would, we would actually have the questions either in one language or the other. Um, and it started to develop much more clearly the extent to which, at first, we were seeing the need to identify really different different populations, practically different communities. As far as political activity is concerned, leadership, organizations, you might even consider them different movements, you know, like the Latino movement in the United States and the Mexican immigrant movement in the United States. But we wound up putting those categories aside and really wound up thinking in terms of what the difference that we were looking at was really different strategies that there is a Latino strategy or Hispanic strategy of organizing and of representing a community in American society, whether to government or to universities or to the private sector, corporations. And there is a Mexicano Migrante strategy. It's a different strategy. You organize people differently. You convene them in a different way, usually for other purposes, um, whether to address the Mexican government or even local authorities, but on the basis of a, a distinct national origin specific strategy. The Latino or Hispanic strategy is one that tries to represent all people of Latin American origin, Hispanics in general, without distinction uh, for national origin. And one of the things that's really characteristic of it is precisely that it is a domestic project. It's a domestically focused agenda. It tends not to look across the border. Whereas the Mexican Migrante strategy is very much, it has defined itself, has consolidated itself as a binational strategy, as a binational project with objectives both in Mexico and in the United States. Uh, so there, that, that difference became clear as our, as our work went on, clearer and clearer as our work went on. And that to a certain extent, but to a variable extent, these two strategies, these grand strategies, correspond to different networks of leaders and organizations. Latino leaders and Latino organizations on the one side, um, and Mexican Miranda leaders and organizations on the other. So just to, just to clarify what we're talking about here. I would like to add to the introduction. Okay. Let's keep going. Just very quickly, we've already heard uh, among the four institutions involved here, I'm at the Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola, Marymount in Los Angeles. We have a colleague in Mexico City, Eddie Tham, Alberto Fernandez de Castro. He's also a senior advisor to the president of Mexico, but he was involved in this before he became a senior advisor to the president of Mexico. Uh, Alex at the Institute for Latino Studies, associate director of the Institute for Latino Studies at Notre Dame, and a colleague who's not with us here, Manuel Garcia Diego, who runs the Southwest Hispanic Research Institute at the University of New Mexico. Okay, I've just mentioned identifying two strategies. We're identifying two strategies, made-up strategies, grand strategies, obviously, not very narrowly defined ones, and networks that correspond to them to varying degrees in different parts of the country. Now, one of the things that we found early on, um, and this is sort of interesting, because most people in Latino studies 
uh, tend to think of everyone having been simply in their national origin group up until just maybe 25, 35, no more than 40 years ago. That is, that people of Mexican origin were here and in the Southwest, and Puerto Ricans were in New York, and maybe a few of them in Chicago, and Cubans were, or Cuban Americans were in Florida, and that they never came together until the 1970s. And it's true, some very important changes happened in the 1970s. Um, major organizations that were created by Mexican American leaders to address needs and issues of the Mexican American community, like the National Council of La Raza, like the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Mande, like LULAC, um, officially redefined themselves in the 1970s as Latino organizations, that they uh, really were addressing the needs and the interests of all Latinos, whatever country they came from. They redefined their, if you look for their mission statement, you know what a mission statement is, you can find it on their website, what's their mission? They don't make any reference to a particular national origin there. They say Hispanic or Latino people in general is, is their concern. Their boards of directors, in some cases like the National Council of La Raza, NCLR, uh, they have bylaws by which their board is supposed to reflect the, the, the diversity of the Latino population in the United States. There are so many Mexican Americans, so many Puerto Ricans, Cubans, uh, and others, etc., on their board. Their staffs are diverse. Those truly are now Latino organizations. Maybe Maldef a little less so than NCLR, um, or even LULAC. Uh, there are other organizations, new ones, important ones, that were established in the 1970s. They were created in the 1970s as Latino or Hispanic organizations. There's NALEO, the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. It was from the beginning a Latino organization. No reference to national origin. Uh, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, which includes all of the members of Congress that are Hispanic or Latino, and it happens to be all Democrat as well because the Republicans <coughs> left. Uh, but, and, there is a, and there is the equivalent on the Republican side. And in each case, made up of a combination of Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and, and Cuban Americans. Uh, so it looks like the Hispanic strategy or the Latino strategy was born in the 1970s. It looks like. But if you dig in deeper, you find that that's not the case. That in fact, the idea, and, and, in, and in fact the practice, of Mexican and people of Mexican origin identifying themselves and presenting themselves and moving in American society as Latino or Hispanic really dates to the 19th century, all the way back to the 19th century. Um, that, uh, and, and this for, for very specific reasons, and a couple of them are, are mentioned here. Um, one of the things that distinguishes being Mexican migrante from Mexican American born here, of course, is that the migrantes are migrantes and the Mexican Americans were born here. The, Mexican origin population, the original Mexican origin of the population of the United States, were the people that already lived in what became the Southwest United States when that was annexed as a result of the U.S.-Mexican War. They were not migrantes. They never left Mexico to come to the United States. As the, you've heard the saying, uh, what was it, they, they, they made a big deal of this, it's an old saying that they used it. We didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, right? That's, that, what interestingly is that that obviously applies literally to maybe somewhere as many as 75,000 people um, in 1848. The border crossed them, right? So they never thought of them, they were not a diaspora. They were not immigrants. They never thought of themselves as having made this decision. They felt tied to that territory, to that land. They were from New Mexico. They were from Texas. In California, they call themselves Californians. And they had actually only lived in a country that was independent called Mexico for a generation, right? I mean, Mexico had only officially was independent in 1821. By 1848, even before 1850, they now are, are part of the United States. So there hadn't been a lot of penetration of Mexican institutions by 1848 when, when that was incorporated. Uh, and then, of course, this that population has succeeding generations, and then uh, new, uh, new immigrants do come in, some of whom assimilate into that population. Interestingly, how, and you see echo, uh, echoes of this, if anybody has ever studied 
the Chicano movement of the 1960s and 1970s. I grew up calling myself Chicano, uh, even though my parents came from Mexico. Um, it was easy to adopt the ideology that you had, you had always been there. I was, you know, I was from uh, El Paso, Texas. And it's like, we were always here, right? Later I discovered actually El Paso had an Anglo majority until sometime in the 1960s. I was shocked to find that. I thought we were always the majority of El Paso. <laughs> that was not the case. I don't. Anyway, so, so there's different histories here. There's the way in which people originally of Mexican origin, not immigrants, became Latino or Hispano or Hispanic. Uh, starting with the 19th century, we're going to get a, a little bit more into that. Um, and there are ways in which new waves of immigrants, migrantes mexicanos, have come considering themselves mexicanos, organizing themselves as mexicanos, actually adopting a strategy of dealing with the United States, with U.S. society and U.S. institutions as, as mexicanos. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how that has happened over time, how that's been reproduced over time, okay? Give me the signal. <laughs> okay, um, I've already mentioned uh, uh, the, the original Mexican origin population was not a diaspora, was not migrantes, it was a territorial minority. One thing that happened, most of all, and this is another thing that in Latino studies, or in Chicano studies especially, is an article of faith. You think that it's only those people in New Mexico that started calling themselves Hispanic. That every, nobody else had these illusions that they weren't Mexican, uh, that only New Mexico. It's not, it's not actually true. Um, but it is something that happens over time, is that where the biggest concentration of Mexican origin people were in 1848 in New Mexico, they officially adopted an identity and a strategy. And it's more than just an identity. We're not talking here about personal preference, what label you like to use here for yourself. That's part of it. But really it's a question of how do you position yourself in American society. And they started to argue that they were there first, they were always there, and they, and, and they referred to themselves as Hispanos. Um, their goals were very much tied to where they lived. They, they had no reason to have cross-border goals or objectives. Their goals were very much in New Mexico, in Texas, in California, in the first instance trying to defend their own land rights or their own position in, in that society, and wanting to, uh, given the fact that it, you may know from the U.S.-Mexican War, the terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which settles the U.S.-Mexican War um, in, in 1848, um, everyone who was, who was a Mexican in those territories was given the option. You either can go, you know, it would be, it would be un decir to say return to Mexico because they already lived, they already lived on their homes and on their land, you can either leave what is now part of the United States and go to Mexico, or you can stay where you are and you would automatically become a U.S. citizen. Right? And that, that was part of, the, part of the treaty. So presumably, I don't know, you, know, you can debate how consciously and how deliberately everybody made that decision, but everybody who did not leave and go to Mexico then accepted U.S. citizenship. And there's been a long, long history, you can say central, to the Hispanic Latino strategy in the United States of trying to make good on full empowerment, full rights, full acceptance um, as Americans. I would point out just very quickly that <coughs> I would point out just very quickly that it, it is it is this treaty that gives rise to the sense that Mexican Mexican Americans are officially quote unquote white, right? And that therefore being Mexican American or being a Latino is not officially a racial category, but rather an ethnic category. Later on, of course, when we start talking about other populations, uh, particularly Central American and Caribbean populations, then it becomes a, a, a real matter of, of absolute necessity because Latinos, of course, come in all sorts of flavors and colors, right? Uh, but at the, from the very beginning, under the terms of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Latinos in a racialized society were considered to be white officially, if not in actual practice. Legally, you may not be aware, I mean, this is like, compared to what? Native Americans were not officially U.S. citizens until the middle of the 20th century. Mexican Americans, as a consequence of the Treaty of Guadalupe, were automatically converted into U.S. citizens, those that already lived there, since 1848, after a year had passed, 1849. Native Americans and Asian immigrants were not allowed to naturalize and become U.S. citizens 
until around World War II. Because we were we had a we had an ally um, in, in the case of China in World War II. Okay, this is an attempt to uh, graphically represent something that's really hard to represent graphically uh, in an adequate way. Uh, what we refer to as the Hispanic slash Latino leadership network in the United States. The organizations, principally the organizations and other institutions that are part of the Hispanic Latino leadership network that we see developing pretty much continuously since the 19th century. Uh, some of these are really notable because they, in terms of the way networks work, I mean, networks are by definition not a hierarchical single organization, but rather a decentralized, interconnected set of individuals and organizations. And there's some here that really serve as hubs uh, of this decentralized sort of organization. But right, right in the middle, we have several categories. One are national Latina or Latino organizations that started as Mexican-American, but redefined themselves as Latino. And there we have LULAC, NCLR, MADLEF, and MANAN. And then there are organizations that were started as Latino organizations from the beginning, such as NANEO and more recently the New America Alliance. And then there's a variety of other organizations. Here, uh, we, we've also included those that remain Mexican-American organizations, that is, that have not gone through that redefinition, such as MAPA, Southwest Voter, GI Forum. Uh, in some cases, it's sort of questionable. There are tons of Hispanic professional associations. I don't know if anybody's already participated in this uh, in college such as the pre-med association, um, uh, engineers, or business students. Um, some are defined by specific national origin, but there's lots of national societies of Hispanic professional engineers, uh, the National uh, Association of Hispanic Publications, uh, the Association of Hispanic Journalists, the Association of Hispanic MBAs, the Hispanic Bar Association, lots and lots of these pan-Latino pan-ethnic, pan meaning all, right, without distinction of national origin, uh, that were started that way, and that mainly date just to the 1970s or 1980s, and some are even more recent than that. There's Latino media, or Hispanic media, that's in English, of course, and most of that tends not to be uh, national origin specific, you know, the magazines, Latina magazine, Hispanic business, Hispanic magazine, Hispanic culture, Latino leaders magazine, you've seen them, there's a whole, uh, there's, there's obviously a market for it, there are Hispanic chambers.